How much support is there for the Northern Ireland Protocol? And how much anger is there within unionism? Last week, senior sources within the DUP briefed the Nolan radio show that some in the party were prepared to accept a best of both worlds solution for the protocol. They were actually pointing us, literally pointing us, to where Sir Geoffrey Donaldson used those words himself in a speech. It was there, in black and white, deliberately written into that speech. There is a better way forward, a way that can truly deliver the best of both worlds. Where goods destined to stay in Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom are not checked upon arrival in Northern Ireland. We have previously outlined how we appreciated the need of the European Union to protect the integrity of its single market borders. And we believe there are solutions if the practical will is there. In other words, access to both markets. In other words, Northern Ireland not being treated the same as the rest of the UK. Now, before Sammy Wilson spoke at an anti-protocol rally in Market Hill, Jim Allister didn't pull any punches. There is no such thing as the best of both worlds. Because to enjoy what is misnamed the best of both worlds, you have to be part of the EU single market. And you cannot be part of the EU single market unless you accept EU sovereignty and EU laws. Afterwards, the DP Sammy Wilson got up to speak and was drowned out by an angry crowd. I thought this was a unionist rally here tonight. And I stand here as a unionist who unashamedly supported Brexit, who unashamedly opposed a protocol. The jeering didn't stop there. I can tell you one thing. The BBC are recording this tonight. And the one thing that the unionist hitting BBC will love to report is that unionists are not united in this fight. That unionists are playing and playing politics with this. So what is this? anger about the DUP all about. They say they're an anti-protocol party. Let's ask our, 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 our guests uh, here in the studio. Well, Jim Alster, you were there. I was there and, and it was a phenomenal turnout on one of the coldest nights of the year. Did you stoke it up? No, I didn't stoke it up. Uh, the, the police said there were between seven and 9,000. And I think when uh, seven to 9,000 people turn up in a, sto in a snowstorm, there is a problem. And the problem is the protocol. And the reason the pro there's a problem with the protocol is because it is about the transfer of sovereignty, British sovereignty, to the EU. Well, we've got the protocol now. Are you no longer British? Well, I'm not British when it comes to the laws that govern my trade. You, have you still got sorry, a British passport? Sorry, sorry, just let me make the point. Just how you're wished, as you told us the other night on your programme. Uh, I'm not British when it comes to trade because our trade laws are now not made in Belfast not made in London, but made in Brussels. So we are subject to EU sovereignty. That's what custom checks are about. Custom checks manifest the fact that you're moving from one sovereign territory to bring goods to another sovereign territory. So when the goods are checked at the puts posts, at, at Larne, etc., they are moving from sovereign British trade-controlled territory to EU territory. So Northern Ireland has been annexed, colonised into the EU, and that is a total infringement of the basic acts of union. He's getting, and, he's trying to get rid of the protocol. Yes. What was that night about? What well, was that about? Well, I think there is a, a, a huge depth of unionist opposition. It's not a single unionist who espouses support for the protocol. And I think there is unease as to whether or not some are strong enough in their opposition. And I think the day that was in it uh, and the day about the talk about the best of both worlds probably didn't go down well and there was that spontaneous reaction in the crowd. And let's be very clear. I think as they I, were booing you because you advocated Brexit and the protocol is that here's oh, no, the consequence the, sorry, of Brexit. Sorry, no, no, the protocol, they were not booing me and the protocol is not Brexit. We didn't get Brexit. We got kept Before in the Brexit, EU single there would be market. No protocol. Sorry, sorry. You can try to dance sorry. around us to the no, cars. No, Stephen, no, Stephen. No, no, no need for clear. a protocol. Let's you be didn't clear. 
what was, didn't came what was Brexit all about? It was getting out of the EU single market, out of their customs code, out of their VAT regime. Did we get that? No. We were well, retained. Then you have so the we dice. didn't get. We have rolled it out. I voted to leave the, the EU on the same basis as we joined. And where were you having. And where, and where was when you were telling everybody to vote for Brexit? So, where was your barrister's analytical mind? Where was the border going to be to protect the I'll tell the you European where it was. It was, it was on the ballot question that I answered. Do you want the United Kingdom? The question wasn't, do you want the United Kingdom to leave and leave Northern Ireland behind? The question was, do you want the United Kingdom so to where, leave? So how we was the EU protecting their single market? How were they doing it, in your view, back then? Sorry? How were they protecting their market back then? By, by having their, their laws governing their single Where market, the their customs be? code. Well, the border should be, if the EU thinks it needs to protect its border against olive oil and other things, then it should be in its territory where it can do it. So you but thought the reason... they were going to put a border in the island of Ireland? That was your gamble? Well, where's the international frontier? But did the you think they were going frontier? to do that? Well, I think they ought to have put that if that was their problem with the single market. If they needed to protect their own single market, then the place to protect it is in their own territory. Why would we be their surrogate? Why would we be handed over uh, to, to EU sovereignty? And that's what the protocol gave us. And, of course, the protocol gave us something that Sorsha will endorse, the fact that all our laws in that ambit are now made by people we don't elect. That's, that's, is that democracy? How can the Alliance Party that well, pretends let's, let's itself to be part herself. of a democratic front Sorcia? if it's not a Jen nationalist front? In fact, I think why can it... Oh, no, 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 in Northern well, Ireland... Well, why, can come back in the right, right, no. How is it right to, and, Jim, to you've have had your laws moment. that we don't make You've had your moment. Them. You haven't adequately set out you your argument. The question. Because the truth is... The vast majority of Northern Ireland rejected Brexit. People who were unionist, people who were nationalist, protocol. people who were unaligned like myself. Do you know why, Jim? Because we wanted this place to do well. And we could see what well an issue no, 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 Brexit speak. was. And that is why we made the decision that we made. And now you have buyer's remorse writ large. So and sure. that is the harsh reality so sure. of what in, we're dealing with. In terms with. of the Alliance Party, tell me where the Alliance Party had any evidence... That, that this had cross-community support, that the protocol has that cross-community support. If you look at the situation that we had, the issue here is Brexit. And the vast majority of people understood that Brexit was incompatible with Northern there Ireland. Three unionist parties and telling you and they that do not the support issue. this protocol. So Does that not matter so to the Alliance Party? So here's the point. No, no, Brexit hold on, it's itself, a good question. This is answering it. Brexit itself was incompatible with Northern Ireland, so there had to be something somewhere. Brexit's and that happened, was we're the talking issue. about now. Your party now, is alive look, and kicking in Northern now, Ireland we look, right now. So what are you doing about the fact that all three unionist parties are saying they do not want this protocol, so there is no cross-community support in 2022? Stephen, Surely that I can matters. tell you today that if elected unionists who take up their seats in the Assembly want to say one thing, I'm out in the doors on a daily basis. And in my constituency of Lagan Valley, there are people that regard themselves as unionists. Do you know what? They're not prioritising the protocol. They're prioritising health, education, housing, climate, jobs. Do you know what? They understand that the Brexit that was foist upon Northern Ireland, that the vast majority that did have cross-community consent against Brexit, they understood that this was the outcome of Jim's rigorous Brexit. And that's where we are today. I have businesses in my constituency that have said, look, if there's going to be a silver lining in any shape or form, we have identified where there is an opportunity. They've taken that. Should the we protocol the change, Sorsha? Given Brexit the fact mess. that there's not one elected unionist representative supporting the protocol, should it change? Alliance have been consistent from the start. We have said that this arises from Brexit. January 2021, whenever it came into force, we had suggested a veterinary agreement. That would do away with a lot of the issues around SPS, around veterinary medicines, around all of the outstanding issues around pet travel, etc. That is what the rest of us are doing, Stephen. We're getting around the table. We're engaging with the EU. We're engaging with the UK and Liz Truss. We are working hard on a daily basis to ameliorate I'll, I'll, those rough moment. edges. I wanna, if, if anyone's out and about uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the streets to... Um, ask some of the, the public what they thought about the protocol. Who do you trust when it comes to the protocol? DUP. Why? Well, I'm hoping that they'll do a good job and get us a good deal with the protocol. Well, I don't trust the British government. Do you trust the DUP? 
No comment. They're as clear as mud. They've made a mistake, and they know they have. And it's coming up bad time for, for elections and all now. Do you think the DUP have been clear when it comes to their stance on the protocol, whether they would get rid of it completely or they want to change it? I don't honestly know. I really don't know. Now, mind you, as I say, I'm thankful I don't have the jobs. Who do you trust when it comes to the protocol? None of them. Why? Just, just they're all full of shit. I haven't got all my kids, I haven't got all my school kids been around the storming. What about the protocol? How key is that for you? To be honest right now, I haven't, right. haven't got much of a clue about it, but... Well, that's your homework for tonight. That is, yeah. Who do you trust when it comes to the protocol? Ryan. Well, that's a hard question to answer. Was You listen to both sides of the arguments and you just tend to figure out right, who is right and who is wrong. So who do you trust on the, the protocol now? Well, who's telling the truth about it? Let's go live to the phone lines again. Thomas Lantrum. Hello, Thomas. What about you, Stephen? Go ahead, sir. Thanks for calling us. Di died in the World Unionist. The protocol is the only show in town. There's no option. It will bring stability, peace and prosperity. And if any Unionist leader was brave enough to stand up and say that, the status quo, the Union... How is survive. it bringing stability? if every elected representative, if you believe in a democracy, our democracy works through the people appointing elected representatives. Every elected representative in unionism is against it. How is that the definition of stability to you? We'll see in the 5th of May, because I am considering if a unionist doesn't stand up and represent me, you know where I'm thinking of putting my mark, Stephen? My dad would turn in his grave. Sinn Féin, because I'm sick of the bickering between the unionist parties, I'm sick of the bickering inside the unionist parties, I'm sick of them saying that a flag will pay my mortgage. We need health, jobs, education, and we need it now, the health services on us need. I live in Antrim. Do you know how many hospitals we have in Antrim, Stephen? Four. Four hospitals. And two of them come from the 19th century. We need proper politics and politicians that will come to the doorstep and if you vote me in, I will do this. So Not vote for me and I'll not do... We need positive politicians. Alison Morris. Need... Alison Morris, thank you for your call, sir. Um, here's the number on the screen, 03030 80 55 55. There it is. Alison Morris, how much of that sentiment is actually what will drive people to vote in this election, or will it always be keep Michelle O'Neill out, put Sir Geoffrey or whoever it is in, keep the bogeyman or woman out? Look, there's, there's clearly unionist anger at the protocol. Anyone who says there isn't, you know, is, is not reading the room. But the fact is, it's not the most important subject at any home, whether that be a unionist home or Republican home or other. The fact is that, you know, we have issues with the health service, the economy. All of those sort of things are going to rank higher up. When it comes to putting that, you know, it comes to voting, I think that the DUP before had a much easier game to play when they tried to do that, you know, if you don't vote for us, you'll get a Sinn Féin first minister. Because then it was Martin McGuinness and they were able to say, former IRA man, do you really want that person being first minister? Michelle O'Neill doesn't come around any of that baggage. She's much harder, I think, to demonise in that sort of way. And do people really feel that strongly about that role anymore? <coughs> you know, Jim Allister's saying, that, you know, all unionism is united against the protocol. But all unionism is not united, and that's what we have seen. There is nothing that has caused more division that I can see within unionism and the unionist family than the protocol and the different differences of opinion to the protocol. And, you know, that event that took place in Market Hill, those people should have been standing there. They all want the same thing. They all want the protocol, the protocol to be scrapped. And yet, look what happened. It descended into farce. And, you know, Jim's sitting there, and he, he couldn't deny that the people at the front of that the front of that crowd who were shouting at, at uh, Sammy Wilson were TUV members and voters. They were shouting, withdraw your candidate. That was what they were shouting at him. You know, these were people Sorry, who wanted you, the DUP to there, move Alison? out. I have seen several oh, videos seen. and you can hear them saying, withdraw your well, candidate well, very clearly. Your, pro your propaganda may suit your cause, but it doesn't fit with the truth. I was there. It was spontaneous reaction. But the fundamental is 
There is not a unionist. Alison Morris Island. does not have a cause, but she's a journalist. Is she not? I'm she's a journalist you, representing you a very respectable they, newspaper. Are you in this denying country? that they were yeah. TUV members and TUV members and party members who were at the front of that crowd who were shouting, "Withdraw your candidate!" TUV candidate members at the Wilson. front, at the back, I'm sure. But uh, they were. None of this was orchestrated. But the fundamental is that there is seething anger amongst the unionist community about the protocol, is and there, rightly so. Sorry, and yet there, we, no, have Saoirse, your... we have Sorsha Eastwood here tonight telling us that this lovely cross-community party, it's only cross-community on an issue Jim. which which uh, affects nationalism. Jim. It, if it affects unionism, forget about Jim. it. That's the approach. Is to there the as protocol. much seething anger that you say there is about the protocol? Is there as much seething anger about health waiting lists? There is. And, and people who think about and that will realise... Are you talking realize, about waiting lists yes, as much yes, as the protocol? Yes. Are you really? Well, well let's, be clear. You? let's be clear. What's your if policy the to reduce them? Sorry, if the protocol uh, runs its full course and we are edged out of the UK, then we lose our free national health service, we go into a republic which the protocol is trying to take us for, to, into which you pay for your health service uh, on every front. So anyone who is interested in preserving the National Health Service needs to see that we need to defeat the dismantling of the union that is coming from the protocol. That's the fundamental reality here, because this protocol is about the dismantling of the union. My goodness, it has already passed control. We already have got customs posts from the rest of the kingdom to here, because we are no longer treated as a part of that kingdom. Co so the, the, the union is being dismantled by this protocol, and most unionists just, get that. You just seared past the waiting list there, didn't you? Mm -hmm. No. You just, you, you, I, you, I, 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 I give you Sorry. an opportunity to tell us, you know, what your policies are about reducing waiting lists. Well, that me means you about... people in this country with no money, right. and they're sitting being told, you will wait two years in pain, and by the way, see if you've got a couple of quid, you buy your way out of pain in this country with private health care. Well, that's let's that, be very, that's what you do in this very, country. It is a them and us. No, no. That's what there is. Let's it's be the very, rich v the poor. Let's be very clear, Stephen. We have got a problem, a huge problem, in our waiting list. Why? Because under devolution, Stormont reduced the number of beds in our hospitals by 1,500 and all the staff that go with it. And then we're surprised that we've got problems when there comes a pandemic or when we've got emergency units overrun. This is a crisis made in Stormont by the existing parties of Con government. Con McGrath, what is your party doing? What is the SDLP doing to reach out to unionism, to say that we hear you, we understand, and we reassure you that something will be done about the fact that the DUP, the UUP, the TUV are saying none of them agree with this? It's been done over their head. What ever happened to consent in this country? Well, I think, first of all, Stephen, it's important to note that there were 56% of people here voted um, to remain part of the EU. So that will have included quite a number of unionists. And then after that, we went through every possible opportunity to find a solution. Uh, there were quite a number that were proposed about customs union, about single market, about SPS checks. They were all offered, and on each and every occasion, the DUP said no, 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 and Jim supported them in that. And that has resulted where there was the only one opportunity left was the protocol. You're and doing now it now. There, You're we... doing it now. Here no. you are, politically point we... scoring against someone else. My question to you is not... What gripes have you got with another political party? What is your party doing to reach out to unionism, which is clearly telling you through their elected representatives, this protocol does not have consent? Well, trying to find the solutions for that. And we have been working the whole time to try and work and deliver something that would be acceptable to everybody. So you, do you agree the, the protocol the should change? The, and the result of Brexit. Do you agree, Colin, the we protocol should, should change? We have said that the protocol wasn't perfect and that we would like to see changes. You voted for rigorous to make implementation. It but the problem was that we have people like Jim that said no to every possible solution. So what we'd say to this is, Jim, where's the solution? Where is, what is it you going to do to get the solution to the problem of Brexit which you caused? Uh, the solution is very simple. Let me know, no, that enough, the Jim. EU gives up its ill-gotten sovereignty bring, in Northern Ireland. Let me bring Ben Laurie back into this. Ben, I want to play you a clip from... Sir Geoffrey Donaldson again, um, when, when he was talking about, it was March 2020, let's have a listen.
in the end, uh, customs checks doesn't mean that you change the constitutional status of a part of the United Kingdom. That's not going to happen. Already we're seeing the political parties and business leaders coming together to, to see how we actually exploit the opportunities that may arise from this situation, not only to ensure we have full access to the UK market, but we've also got access to the EU market. So that's Sir Geoffrey talking to Dempster back in 2020, Ben. But does it not change the, these customs checks? Does it not change the constitutional position? I would have thought that Sir Geoffrey Donaldson would be somewhat embarrassed by those comments now because of the way the mood has changed. There's a fundamental tension in the DUP going back 40 years, not to its origins more than 50 years ago, but certainly when Peter Robinson and so on became uh, more prominent, it became an increasingly pragmatic party that liked to govern. And if you like to govern, there have to be um, uh, compromises. Uh, when it comes to the protocol, I think it's widely felt within unionism and probably within the DUP that the party moved too quickly to a position of pragmatism, best of both worlds. What people have been finding out, what most unionists and people who study it closely have been finding out, that you can under the protocol have the best of the EU single market and you can have much of the UK internal market, but it's the UK internal market that is hampered and fettered. In other words, it is the internal movements within the UK that are delayed. And that's a massive, massive um, constitutional change in one part of life here. And I think the only reason it's got this far within unionism, there was a man in the clip who was refreshingly honest there who said, you hear people saying well, one thing and people saying yeah, another. But then is it any and, and a lot of people, because they're not sure of the implications, it, haven't been as angry about the protocol as they, they would be. Alison Boris, is it any wonder why some unionist voters might be confused on Friday? The DUP w w w was talking about how the protocol had, had changed the constitutional position of Northern Ireland. They said it had been altered without their consent. Now Sir Geoffrey in 2020 saying it doesn't alter the constitutional position. Like, what is it, Alison? I think he's been forced into a more hardline position just by what has been happening within unionism within his own party. You know, if you go back to when Arlene was leader, she was saying something quite similar at the beginning, you know, that this could be an opportunity. And then obviously they seen what way the wind was blowing in terms of members of their own party and also her hardline unionism and, and various different opinion polls. We could say there was a massive sway towards the TUV and that clearly spooked them, um, at which point we've seen a change in the language that has been used. But the question that, you know, I would be asked and if I was a unionist voter, what do they really believe? You know, do they believe that it's an opportunity or do they believe that it's a threat to Who the union? Who wrote best of both worlds in the Donaldson speech? Yeah, I mean, and exactly. It shows you even within the DUP, there are those who are trying to still pull the party towards that more liberal view and trying to make the protocol, albeit have it, have it changed and have it reworked, but there are those who think that, you know, or I think that those who realise that the protocol is never going to disappear in its entirety. It's impossible for it to disappear and for Brexit to still exist and it has to remain in some ways. They have to try and look like they've got a victory from the EU. That's the problem. There's only a very short space of time between now and the election. Yeah. Whatever happens in those negotiations, rather than seeing it as a failure, the DUP are going to have to try and spin it as some sort of win for themselves. Here's Mark and Lisburn. We're live on BBC One tonight. Our number is 03030 80. 55, 55. It's really important to us that you can be engaged in the news live into this uh, station. That's why BBC Northern Ireland exists. Mark, go ahead. Morning, Stephen. Or, sorry, evening, Stephen. Um, see, to be honest, I, I'm a DU, I was an ex DUP supporter. Uh, they will not get my vote again because they can't be trusted. And it's not just in the protocol, there's too many things that the DUP have said and they go back on. And that's why a lot of the unionist people now don't trust them. And you just got to see this internal Well, you look at the problem. significant mandate that the DUP has had for many, many years. Lots of people in this country trust them. Well, that's what I was going to say. You see on that mandate, Stephen, it was orange and green. And, and people voted. Uh, you, you've already stated in your programme earlier, the, it was easier to sell, um, keep Michelle O'Neill or keep Martin McGuinness out of First Minister. It was easy to do that at that stage. Now people are seeing them for what they are. They, they, they want to make deals with us. They are unionist parties at the minute because their support's wavering. See, when they were on top, they wanted to trample on everybody. They didn't care. They, all, the DUP and a lot of unionist areas are not trusted. You've seen it at the rally the other night. And why uh, Alison said it was some of Jim Allister's supporters or not, I, it's not... 
It's everybody, a majority of unions that I, I talk to don't trust them no more. They don't trust well, them. Well, that's your, that's your anecdotal observation, which obviously you're entitled to. Uh, John Tong, you, you know, you, 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 you hear the sentiment from that caller uh, tonight and you just wonder, there, there are some very seasoned strategists in the DUP that will be trying to, to work out what message they sell in this election, as every party will be. I wonder what the most powerful message to the Northern Ireland electorate is in this election. Is it about the protocol or not? Well, inter well internally, the DUP leadership is still quite upbeat. They don't believe the, the polls uh, as they stand, which uh, obviously give a very bad message to, to the DUP. They think it will be much closer. They think that quite a few of the seats, the DUP seats are actually safe. Uh, and they don't see who's going to take them. So uh, he, he, morale is still surprisingly high within the DUP, more than, more than you might think. But the level of disunity within the DUP with two, one ex-leadership camp and one current leadership camp briefing against each other doesn't help. I think that the, the message from Jeffrey Donaldson, the original best of both worlds on the protocol, I think that was slightly testing the water from uh, Jeffrey Donaldson at the time. And the message that came back from the party and indeed from... Uh, DUP electors was it's not the best of both worlds. It really matters, and so you've seen that. So why did they say the literally right. out of his mouth the best of both worlds? Why did he say? Well, it? I think both he and both he and Arlene Foster might have thought that genuinely. I think that when the message was road tested, though, amongst DUP electors, the message came back: No, we don't think it's the best of both worlds. We're opposed to the protocol. Now, there's a section of unionism that is much more moderate on the protocol. And you've got a serious fault line within unionism. You've got a UUP that does not believe at all in bringing down Stormont, threatening the institutions, versus the DUP and TUV who do who do believe in that. It's not it's not a serious fault line as you saw at the time of the Good Friday Agreement, but it's a very significant one. And ultimately, the DUP's position does pose a serious this... threat to the future of the institutions. How, how many people think that the DUP are going let to be me... nominating a first or deputy let first me... minister let... immediately after the election? I don't. Sean, thank you. Let me see if I can squeeze Alex in. One last call tonight. Hello, Alex. Hello, Stephen. How are you? Very quick. I can give you one minute, sir. Go ahead. All right. Well, then, I'll make it very short. Come May and Sinn Féin are the leading party and Michelle O'Neill is the leader. Is she going to call for you United Ireland or not? Well, she's What's already called for United up? Ireland. Sorry? She's already calling for United Ireland. No. It's but not going to be she, breaking news that Michelle O'Neill's called for United party, Ireland. If they're the top party, they will be heard more. But and can, if there's United Ireland, what happens then? They can only be First Minister if they find the some stooge of a unionist party to be deputy. Here. You mean, you mean if, the, you mean if unionism actually accepts the result of a democratic election? A democratic election in which you can't vote a party out of government? A democratic election where people can decide that? to vote for others. Be be Sinn Féin is not in government to make Northern Ireland work. And if I have the opportunity of wow. blocking them by refusing to nominate a deputy, wow. I will do it unashamedly. Because the last thing Northern Ireland okay. needs is those who glorify terrorism as at the weekend as First Minister, but they can only be First Minister okay. if a, some unionist Jim, party you. helps them. Thank you very much, Sorsha. Thank you for coming in. Thank you to Colin McGrath uh, tonight as well. Now, before we go this evening, I want to pass on my sympathies to the family of Christopher Stolford and indeed to his party colleagues in the DUP and to his friends. Christopher died suddenly at the weekend at the age of just 39. Across the political spectrum, there have been tributes this week and the normal divided world of politics united, uh, did unite in its admiration for Christopher. No matter what stories the Nolan Show was involved in, Christopher always greeted me with a handshake and a smile, except on one occasion back in 2013, when a call went out for children in need to find volunteers to pie me in the face. And Christopher was the first in the queue. Thank you for your company tonight. Good night.